it was the second time that I had the opportunity to go to Primary Children's Hospital and meet with the Ethics Board. We had met with them one time, but they felt like there would be some more studies, some more support uh, from the hospital to maybe heal her, make her whole. And this is my daughter, Kiva Deja Wells, that I speak of. The second appointment was her body was shutting down, and we needed to make a decision, and we needed to make it quick. And the beauty of it was when I went to the ethics board, the doctors and the nurses that have been tending to her and been working with me closely were there to meet me. I didn't know they were going to be there. But they believed it was time to, it was more humane to let her go than to keep her on life support. When she was born, she was diagnosed with a condition called McCune-Albright syndrome, which, is, which was a very rare condition. Um, this was back in October 1999, October 13, 1999. And... A doctor just happened to notice something about her. He happened to notice that something was off. He happened to notice he had seen something similar like this before, and so he contacted NIH, National, National Institute of Health out of Maryland. And they said, look for A, B, C, D, and then let us know. And he looked for A, B, C, D and found A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, and immediately she became a case study for them. Um, all her care came through um, email via N NIH because primary children had no idea what to do. They had no clue. Basically, it's a genetic disorder, and it's really very, very rare. And they told me that the possibility of you having another child like this is one in a gazillion. They said she is a cosmic happening. And, um, but they were able to study her very, very well. And basically, her whole, her whole endocrine system was doing the opposite of its proper function. And so there was quick shutdown and a lot of things going on. Now, we had decided to take her off the life support. Um, they told me, come in. You can come in. And I said, I can't. I I'm going to cry. I it'll be too painful. I I'll let my friend go in, and I'll just stand not too far away uh, when you take it out. I just didn't want to see them take the tubing out of her, you know, S sparing myself more pain and, and suffering and, and these challenges I was having. And um, they took the tubing out of her, and she cried. Now, here's the deal. I didn't get to hear her, her last cry because I was too chicken. I was too afraid to go into the room and be part of that experience. Now, what I do know to be true since then is that our loved ones never want us to have the what ifs. What if I'd done this? What if I'd done that? What if I stayed longer? What if I shared more of my, ah, what if I got to the hospital on time? And I know they do not wish for us to ever have regret. And this is just the very beginning of her schooling, mom. This, this soul, this Kiva, you know, every time I come out and I speak and I share and I talk about her, she's right here. And she's very conscious and very aware that we're having this dialogue right now. And that's one of the greatest beauties and one of uh, the biggest lessons I learned from her in this lifetime. And, um, and so I began to go into the room and my friend had told me she cried a little bit, felt a little bad, and then I knew I need to stay strong. I'm supporting her. I am ushering her into the next phase of her life. Because you see, I truly believe, and I've learned from her over and over and over again, there is no death. There is what we call a transitioning. And what she did was trans transition from one form into the next form. And I got crystal clear about that. And I remember walking into the room, sitting on that plush, beautiful green rocking chair, and they handed her to me, five pounds, uh, not five pounds, five months, seven pounds, and they handed her to me, and I remember holding her, my hand on her chest, watching it go up, watching it go down, watching it go up, and feeling it go up and going, just the inhale, the exhale, the beauty of life, the beauty of expression. And then within an hour, which literally felt like five minutes, it took an hour, she left her body. Now, what happened after this led me to my life's work and what it is that I do today. I'm holding her. She takes three distinct breaths. <sighs> Very clear. And in that moment, she left from the crown of her head. I felt an immense amount of heat leaving the crown of her head as I sat there. And immediately after that took place, a hand went on my shoulder and a person stood beside me. And I knew in that moment it was her. And as I began to marvel in all this energy and all this beauty, be this beauty I picked her up and I put her back in her bed and I, just, I took a, a moment just to notice how 
there was nothing in this form. It was now it was it was like a clay formation. I, I just I remember just soaking it all in because this was really important, right? And I would find out later. And I remember just going, you're not there anymore, and walking out of the room and had a friend there with me. And we're going to the elevator. The elevator opens up, and I hear, hey, wait for me. I'm coming with you. And I'm thinking, I'm going crazy. But I knew I wasn't because I had some other experiences prior to that. And it was clear as day, and I thought to myself, and I just got in the elevator, and I put my head down. And I'm like, I wonder if my friend just heard that. I, if, I can't tell her. She looked up at me and said, did you hear that? <laughs> she heard it too. And it was just like that during the whole proceedings, the whole pre preparation for celebrating her life and her services where she was just in people's faces and doing things and, and she would leave evidence and I mean, you just couldn't deny it. And I remember at her celebration of life, they were all female pallbearers. They were all beautiful, um, like canary yellows and pastel pinks. And, and I remember now her passing, well actually, maybe I didn't tell you this, but she passed on my favorite, favorite holiday. I'm from Boston. I live in Utah now, but I'm true Bostonian. And, uh, um, and it was just, St. Patrick's Day is my favorite holiday. We celebrate like crazy, you know? And I thought, is this going to be one of those holidays I'm going to dread? And it turns out I still love and I still celebrate St. Patrick's Day, but that is the day that she transitioned. And I remember going home one day. It was just maybe a couple of weeks after I had buried her body. And I walked into her, my room. It was pitch black and something knocked me off my feet, and I found out there's actually a condition where if you don't deal with the grief or the pain and be in, in relationship with your emotions, that it will knock you on your butt. And, uh, <laughs> and that's what it did, and I lied there, and I cried, and I screamed, because I was always the strong one. I was being strong for the other kids. I was being strong for my friends. I was being, woo, LeVon can handle this, right? Bostonian power. And, uh, and it, it knocked me. It knocked me. And I remember laying there, and then within a matter of minutes, I sat up in this pitch black room, and I said, if I'm going through this, and I'm pretty strong and pretty powerful, what are other people doing? People that are being misunderstood, people going through the loss and the grieving process. And that's when I made it my commitment and my dream to literally get up off that floor, and start creating systems, start going out and just speaking and sharing from my heart and sharing workshops and doing whatever it takes to just get people to get to this place where it's okay to grieve. It's normal, it's natural, and we experience so much loss in life, but we gotta keep on going, keep going. And so with that said and done, I love you, I honor you, and oh my gosh, life after life, there is no death. Thank you.